Bueno, tomamos siete minutos. Muy buenos días a todos, perdonad por los, por los problemas técnicos, pero ya por ser directo. Eh, bienvenidos a todos los que os habéis acercado a la sala y a los que estáis viéndonos por Zoom. Eh, como sabréis, eh, esta semana estamos teniendo la octava edición de la reunión española de física solar y biosférica, aquí que nos habéis acogido maravillosamente. Y entonces hoy enlazamos entre la reunión y el seminario habitual que, que hay, tenéis en el día y tenemos la suerte de contar con con Teresa, con la doctora Teresa Nieves Chichilla, que es una presentación rápida, hizo, hizo doctorado en la Universidad de Alcalá y que se fue luego a compartir su, toda su experiencia, todo su conocimiento a, a, Estados, a los Estados Unidos en el Goddard Space Flight Center, Center. <ríe> de la NASA, y allí trabaja sobre todo con estudiando estructuras de las CMS, de las partículas energéticas y las relaciones con, con la Tierra. Ajá. Liderando grupos de trabajo en lazos y. Sí, y lazos. <ríe> y, y algo que a mí también me, me impresiona, me gusta mucho, es que tiene mucho trabajo de, de, de mentorías y de, de CUSA, que era la Españoles Científicos en USA, que lo, lo, lo fundaste tú. Bueno, lo fundamos entre varias ¿verdad? personas. Entonces, para hacer mentorías y ayudar a las nuevas generaciones de, de estudiantes. Y es la Project Scientist, la científica de proyecto de la colaboración Solar Orbiter la misión Solar Orbiter en, en NASA, y nos, eso es lo que nos va a hablar, de la relación Solar Orbiter y la colaboración con, entre Europa y, y Estados Unidos, entre esa NASA, para la misión Solar Orbiter. Entonces, vais a ver mucho Solar Orbiter, un poquito más por aquí también, por corporativismo. Yo, oye, yo quiero esa camiseta. <ríe> yo quiero esa camiseta. Luego, luego compramos y repartimos entre todos. Entonces, nada, disfrutad mucho de, de la charla. Y, Thank you, Julián. Gracias. Eh, bueno, a mí me dijeron que la charla la podía, o sea, que la, la hiciera en inglés, que era preferible. Eh, como mi lengua es el español, pues quiero agradecer en primer lugar en español a todos vosotros por estar aquí y por dejarme, por dejarme contar un poquito de Solar Orbiter y un poquito de mi ciencia. Eh, now I'm going to switch to English. Um, so, I'm Teresa Nieves. I am a scientist, and it's something that I like to say at the beginning because I'm still doing science, uh, despite I'm doing also this role of leading the, the mission uh, at NASA. A solar Orbiter is um, a joint mission between the European Space Agency and NASA. Is led by NASA, by the Europeans, and we make a contribution, as you will see later in the presentation. The presentation, by the way, is going to be very easy. So I saw a very uh, hard science in the beginning of the day today, but this is going to be very easy. Uh, I just want you to have an overview of the mission and learn about what is going on in terms of the collaboration and next steps and also how the teams are working and how you can be also involved with the science. As I said, uh, is, uh, Solar Orbiter is a joint mission between the Europeans and the, uh, the NASA agencies. Uh, the common goal is to study the sun and the heliosphere and the interaction between these two elements of our uh atmosphere of the sun right mm -hmm. and this is also an example a good example of the international collaboration not just between two agencies is also among many countries many teams many cultures languages and i think it's a good example for the for the international community not just the uh, uh, scientific international community in general uh, The, the world, how to learn to work together for a common goal. Uh, it was a long journey to get here to launch this satellite, and I, I was not there. Juan Carlos, probably Valentin, also, and many others were uh, enjoying the journey to to get at this satellite in the in the space. Well, I always like also to start these presentations with a message that we all here know for sure, but uh, uh, we sometimes forget, and is that we live in the atmosphere of one star, the sun. 
And this atmosphere is created by a magnetized plasma that is flowing away gradually in all directions from the sun to the boundaries of the heliosphere, where is the interface between the, the solar wind and the interstellar wind, and is far, far away. As this, uh, this flowing of magnetic field, magnetic plasma is moving away, uh, in, the, in the speeds between uh, 200 kilometers per second, 800 kilometers per second, in average. But sometimes there is a gust of wind that can reach the 2,000 kilometers per second. And when it happens, uh, there is a, a strong impact in our tiny bubble, which is the magnetosphere, and is what you see here. We are human living here in the planet, and though we, we have um, this inherent uh, need to, to learn about what is our role as hum human in the space. We want to learn about the star, our sun, and you are doing this very here in this institute and very well. And, the, and we want to understand this because we, need, we want to research and learn about the star. We want to compare the star also and use this knowledge to compare with the stars in the universe. And eventually we, we want to answer questions, philosophical questions like, oh, what are we doing here, right, in this, in this universe? As we do this, we also have a need, and it's also a human need to explore. We explore the Earth, but now we are in the moment that we are exploring the space. And we are exploring the space and using the space. We are living in the space. We are living or using also the space to do science, not just astrophysics, but also many other uh, uh, science, but biology, health, many others are now using the space, the component of the space to develop the science. And we, as I said, we are exploring and we are doing now something, we are coming back to the moon and uh, NASA has a program, as well as many other agencies. It's called the Artemis program. We are right now in the phase two, is the Artemis two. A few weeks ago, the crew of the Artemis two was presented to the, to the community, to the public. And then by next year, November, more or less, we will go back uh, and orbit around the moon. From there, there are many other phases in the Artemis, and I'm gonna talk about this program. But the final goal is to create a colony in the moon and to use the moon as the first st uh, stop to go to Mars, which is the moon to Mars program also for NASA. So this is... <laughs> so, and then we are starting, as I say, to explore and to live in, this, in the space. And we are using this space, and we all here, this community is learning about this space with a central and common question, how the sun create and control the heliosphere. And we do in parcels, we like to classify with those, and this is our way, this is why solar orbiter, because we are using many eyes to explore this and learn about this space with this common uh, question. We use this parcel, which is the solar physics, heliospheric physics, geophysics, which are the, let's say, main three elements for a solar orbiter. But obviously, in heliophysics, we have many other elements like a planetary physics and outer heliospheric physics, which is very also amazing and exciting how we are interacting with the rest of the universe. Um, so I, I forgot to mention that I wanted, all, when I came to this meeting, I came yesterday, I arrived yesterday, I'm living in one hour or two hours. One of my personal goals was to interact with you and to learn about what is going on in Spain and with the Spanish community. And I always wanted to know how the heliophysics is is being saved by the Spanish community. So if you have any feedback later, please let me know. So and in the previous slide, I didn't include the space weather because space weather is, 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 is actually embracing all these elements. 
Space weather uh, is composed um, for all the conditions that are happening in the sun, in the solar wind, but also in the magnetosphere, and also in the ionosphere, and also in the thermosphere. And we also talk about um, space weather now. We are starting to explore the space weather in Mars and many other planets. And as uh, when we talk about the space weather, we, we talk about all the elements that are, can affect the performance um, and actually endanger the performance on the, 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 the space technology, the technology in the space, but also the technology at the ground level is also affecting to the human health. So, and to learn about the space, whether we need all the previous heliophysics and many other science to, to, to be prepared. So that's why many agencies as uh, NASA and also European Space Agency, among other agencies in the planet are putting together efforts to uh, be prepared, to be prepared, to prepare the society and uh, to look for a strategies, actions plan, um, also politics in order to prepare the community, the society, for a space weather assets. In fact, there are also United Nations or because uh, through the Office of Outer Space Affairs are trying to also put together uh, many other emerging countries in this effort. And obviously NATO is very interested that many other military agencies in the countries are putting a lot of energy to learn about these space weather strategies and to be prepared and protected. So in the terms of the space weather, when we talk about this, we talk about the uh, impact in the communication, in our satellites, scientific uh, satellites also in the space, GPS, but also in at the ground level, we have power grid impact, but also in also these pipelines in the, um, underground uh, pipelines. And for us that we are traveling, flying from one country to other, we are obviously very impacted and we are still learning about that. And this is why solar orbiter, because solar orbiter is not just to learn about solar, the sun and the solar wind and the heliosphere, is also to learn to how the sun works and how can we predict the sun and how can we control and mitigate the impact in our lives. Obviously, the, the question that we have here is very huge question. So that's why Solar Orbiter is focused on four questions. First one is a focus in the solar wind, how the magnetic field is created and how the solar wind uh, is driving the solar wind to the heliosphere. And we want to understand how the dynamo work in the solar, this model work and how is the connection between the sun and the, the, the corona and the rest of the heliosphere. We want to understand how is the impact of these large scale structures called corona mass ejections and bring a, a variability in the heliosphere and how they also affect the propagation of the energetic particles that are created in the sun. So these are the four questions that the teams in Solar Orbiter are focused on. So, and here is uh, the animation of Solar Orbiter. Solar Orbiter and the summary of the life after launch was launched in February, 2020, right before the pandemic start. It was really fun, I will tell you. Uh, <laughs> it was launched from Cape Canaveral in the Atlas V for, in the configuration for 1.1. Uh, right after it uh, uh, started, and I will tell you the story later, uh, we had the cruise phase for 18 months, and then November 2021, we started the a nominal phase. During this nominal phase, all the instruments are working nominally, telescope and in-situ observ uh, observatories. During the cruise phase, only the in-situ instruments were working, and remote sensing instruments were uh, doing um, check out windows. Uh, later at the end of the mission, we have the extended mission and we'll see and talk about more later. In general, the orbit is around six months. 
So every year we have like two long-term period or planning periods. And during each of these orbits, we have three dedicated remote sensing windows, right, you know, around the sun, very close to the sun. These three dedicated remote sending, sensing windows is when uh, are when the space, the telescopes are on and looking at the sun and the heliosphere. Out of these windows, just the in situ instruments are working uh, nominally. Mm -hmm. So to get the, so we are gonna have a very, we are having very, a very elliptic orbit. So we go to the sun, getting an, a, a closest approach of 0 0.29 astronomical units and back to 0 0.9 astronomical unit. And to get this orbit, obviously, we need gravitational assistance from planets. In this case, it's Venus. We use Venus, as you see in the animation. We go there and then Venus is the one throwing and changing the orbit of the satellites. And in that way, we are going to get this uh, closest approach. And also, we are going to bring um, solar orbiter away from the ecliptic plane in very unique uh, tilted orbit to be able to observe the poles of the sun for the first time ever. So this is the summary of the, the, the mission. Let's talk about the politics a little bit. So Solar Orbiter is for uh, part of the program Cosmic Vision for the ESA, is part of the program Living with the Star for the NASA. Uh, as I said, is led by the Europeans. Uh, in this case, is Daniel Mueller and Luis Sanchez, the one are leading uh, the operations uh, right now. Before the launch, it was also another Spanish guy. I don't remember the name. Yes. So he was the project manager and he was is in charge of the uh, spacecraft uh, and also the integration of the and testing of all the elements. Ten instruments on board, as I say, in, in the US has four contributions in terms of the, 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 the instrumentation. We have two sensors in two of the instruments. We have solo high, which is a biospheric imager. And also we have contribution in SPICE in, in for the calibration. And here is also very interesting that I, in terms of emission, solar heliospheric mission, solar orbiter is part of the long standing tradition with ESA. First of all, uh, Ulysses, that it was the first mission to go through the poles, uh, use, observing just in situ, in situ, taking in situ observations. And the, in the case of SOHO, SOHO also has a very strong Spanish contribution. And I was very curious um, because it was in, in terms of the solar heliospheric missions, SOHO, solar orbiter. And I was coming here just wondering what's next? How is gonna be the transfer of this huge knowledge uh, from solo, SOHO, solar orbiter to the new generation of scientists in Spain? Mm. They know the transfer of experience, the know-how, politics, everything. So I'm very interested if there is any, any idea or ongoing project in the community. So and I, as I mentioned, just wrapping up here to understand the connection between the sun and the, and the heliosphere, we have the in situ measurements, magnetic field, plasma, energetic particles and waves. In terms of the remote sensing instruments, six telescopes with different wavelengths observations of the sun's surface. And we have also simultaneous uh, high resolution imaging and spectroscopy. <clears throat> we are also observing vector magnetic field. And I saw this morning a presentation using this information to, to observe the backside of the sun. And, it's also the feeding for many space weather um, uh, tools uh, and to, uh, to make uh, reliable predictions. And we are observing also with the coronograph and heliospheric imager uh, the sun and connect with the in situ. This is the map of, and the architecture of the, the spacecraft, and I'm going to go through, the, through this. 
but uh, also just to show the complexity of the spacecraft with the shields at the front. And uh, in terms of the, uh, here also the teams, there are, as I said, 10 instrument teams with flags, but each of these flags is also a consortium of uh, several countries. For instance, in the in EPD, uh, we have uh, um, US, uh, we have one of the sensors CIS, that is lead for, by um, APL in, in, in Maryland. And also we have in SPICE contribution from US, in SWA we have contribution in the, uh, from the US, and also I know that Spain also has a contribution in fee, right? So there is a, you know, I, I try to count the number of countries involved here and it's complicated, but it's more complicated to count the number of teams in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the mission. And this is also in, in pictures, how the life, the, the history of, uh, of a solar orbiter, from the moment we you started to, thought, uh, to think about solar orbiter in the 90s, uh, to put together, to sit together with engineers and think about what, is, uh, what kind of questions we want to answer and how we are going to do that, to the spacecraft itself, that I never had the opportunity to see in real world. But I, I, was, I was very close right there the uh, day before uh, the, the spacecraft went inside of the rocket, but I, I couldn't see the spacecraft. And this is also the European team in, in the moment of the days before the launch. The launch was a beautiful launch in the night of the, the 9th to the 10th of February. Um, and it, for me, it was an experience, a huge experience. And as I say, um, we had this moment when we came back home and then this pandemic started to, to happen. And, you know, it was very weird because we, it was February and a month later, we had the commissioning activities that are, as you know, it has, they had, have to happen I, when we are in the near Earth environment, because the communication between the ground segments, the telemetry and commands are very easy to, 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 to send to the spacecraft. So we couldn't wait. Normally, all the teams used to travel to the mission operation center. In this case, it was in Germany, but none of them obviously could do this exercise. So the creativity of the teams were amazing. So here is an example is Chris Owen. Uh, he Owens, he is in UK and he was with several monitors in the MOOC. There was some of the technicians that they were working 24 seven with the PIs to make these commissioning activities happen, which honestly, and it worked. Here you can see the, 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 the graphs, the plots, the first light images of all the instruments. And all of them started to, to work nominally and start the nominal, the, the cruise phase started in later in June, at the end of May, more or less. So a side effect also of the pandemic, another side effect of the pandemic. And the, here in the plot, the lifetime of the mission. So distant to the suns from the time to the end of the mission of the expected extended mission, cruise, nominal, and extended mission. Uh, so as you, uh, here is the distance to the sun and also the latitude. As I say, we are gonna have uh, this uh, very tilted uh, orbit. So we launch and then we use the gravitational assistance from Venus one and two, and with the Earth gravity assistant, which marked the beginning of the nominal phase, we were able to get the 0 33 astronomical units, and then we are going to be in this orbit for the rest of the nominal mission. And then in the case of the tilt, uh, we started to play with the tilt at the beginning of the nominal mission. And then it's gonna be uh, sometime in 2025 using the gravitational assistant also from Venus, when we are gonna start to elevate the spacecraft from the, from the <coughs> ecliptic plane. And then it will be at the end of the mission in the extended mission where we are gonna get the 33, 34 degrees of inclination for the orbit. 
Um, and this is another exercise also that I wanted to share with you because, as I say, the, the, the planning of the mission, the activities, the scientific activities of the, of the mission is almost, more or less every six months. We have three windows in these six months. So here we have the second half of the year. And we just come back uh, Monday and Tuesday. We had in Isaac the, this exercise, all the teams together. And we were starting to plan. We, first of all, we made the decisions about where the remote sensing windows are going to happen, how it's going to happen, and when and where. And then we, the teams start to put together the interests of each one. Sometimes it's all together, sometimes it's just by groups. And, as we are doing this exercise with the time, we are now in the LTP 13 or 12, 13. So in this case, uh, we are starting to bring the community um, to do this planning. And I, that's why I bring this here, because if you have an idea, if you think I ca you can use any of the resources in Solar Orbiter to make an experiment, to, be, to do an observation, even if you are not part of the instrument teams, you can go, you can come to us and request this time of this uh, experiment. So don't hesitate to come to us and bring your wishes. We can make it real. <laughs> um, now I'm going to jump very quickly to the some mission accomplishments. Uh, obviously, it's been three years, and there are many things that are, have, have, have been happening uh, in the mission. We have for now two dedicated uh, topical issues in astronomy and astrophysics. Uh, the first one was uh, results from the cruise phase, and then the first results from the nominal mission phase. Obviously, Solar Orbiter is publishing in many other the teams, the scientists are publishing in many other journals, but this, uh, these are the two dedicates to the Solar Orbiter. And this is an example of the joint mission. When we talk about Solar Orbiter, we talk about collaboration. And it was the spirit in the, in the mission. And this is what is happening in the science uh, here. This is very interesting because it was a CME. It was in, in March 2022. Um, it was a very interesting coronal mass ejection uh, with a very interesting and energetic flare. And it was observed by the UAI, and it was observed by, um, by uh, sticks, X-rays. And then the CME was in the direction away from solar orbiter. It was not detected, measured by any in situ, in situ instrument. Uh, but I, I, still, because of the waves, the radio waves, we were able to identify or, or predict that it's gonna, the, the, this CME was driving a very strong shock at the front. And with an energetic particle detector, even the CME, the structure didn't pass through the spacecraft, the propagation and transport of these energetic particles were able to reach the EPD instrument on board of Solar Orbiter. So this event has been focused of an, a lot of uh, uh, scientific activities and many papers. And here is the star also. The, probably you all have uh, heard about the campfires. Some of you are very upset with the name that the, the community gave to these campfires, right? But uh, I have to say that at the beginning, when I saw the first time the images, I thought, I mean, this is a perfect name because they really seem to be uh, campfires at the sun, right? So these tiny, small, is uh, players with uh, they can last from seconds to 400 uh, seconds or maybe uh, <laughs> the, 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 the size the dimensions go from four uh, I think it's four kilometers to 400 kilometers or something like that you probably know better than me and the the thing is and you know better than me also that these flares are bringing back a, a question, an open and a strong question in our community about the heating of the corona. And it seems that um, is the cause, the may, may be the main cause of the heating in the corona. And this is also bringing a lot of research in the community, and I think it's very interesting. There are many, uh, this is from, uh, 
the papers, papers like these papers from Etienne, Berhams, and Parnesa. Um, as I say, uh, these flares are just reconnection. You know that I'm going to explain more. Uh, but uh, it seems that it's bringing uh, a lot of an interesting uh, research here. Switchbacks, for those are also connected with Parker Solar Probe mission, an American mission also, very, the sister mission for Solar Orbiter. Switchbacks is one of the main topics there. And as, as switchbacks is also, um, according with many papers in the 90s, uh, is also very connected with uh, interchange reconnection in the sun surface. And this is just like, lasting until you know sometime in the corona and then uh, there are many ongoing studies about these which packs at least is what i see in the u.s community i don't know if here is also focus of a lot of studies one of the things that solar orbiter brought metis the instrument the coronograph in one of the observations start to uh, to see these kind of shapes in the in the images and they associate this structure with the switchbacks that are observing and, and are being observed by by parker in situ um, so there is also a very a lot of controversy here because uh, you know some, some of you may or the parker team is saying no these are not switchbacks because it's, the dimensions are very huge comparing with the kind of or dimension of the switchbacks uh, that we are observing with our instruments well I think it's very interesting in any case, the discussion. In terms of the space weather, also a solar orbiter is bringing a lot of low latency data, is bringing a lot of information for space weather predictions. It's not real time data, but it's low latency and very quick, almost real time, depending on the location of the spacecraft with, uh, with respect to the Earth. So this is one case also of the, of the study of collaboration. We saw a very clear corona mass ejection at the sun and very clear with uh, UI, with coronographs and uh, heliospheric imagers. And then we observed the CME, as you see in the magnetic field, observed by solar orbiter and later at Earth. You can see the huge and smooth rotation in the magnetic field direction that indicate mm -hmm. that the flash bulb, the CME, is crossing the structure. These are very interesting kind of studies, and there are many studies related with, uh, with this, not just with this event, events like this, where we have a very good suite of instruments observing the, the structures and also multi-point um, uh, observations of the same structure. This to me, and it was on also in March last year and, and triggered a lot of geomagnetic activity. So this allow us to study the evolution of these CMEs as they propagate in the heliosphere. And this is also for you, and this is just for a little bit of joy here uh, to see how is the resolution of the, the, the instrumentation. For you, solar physicists, probably you enjoy this kind of observations of the, you know, all these loops and features at the sun. And then let me just bring, because I'm running out of the time, right? A little bit, a little bit. Okay, and I still have something. This is one example also of the, of the US instrument. Here you can see uh, it was a CME, well, a several CMEs, as you can, here we have the map, Earth, the stereo A, and then we have several CMEs and different plane of skies for the instruments on board of the stereo A and Earth. We have also uh, some weather solar orbiter, and then all these heliospheric imagers were observing the, the <coughs> and all these heliospheric imagers are instruments from the same team, from NRL. And uh, you see how they are evolving over the time. So as you see with solo high, the resolution of the structure, the finest structure are very better ca captured by the, the instrument. And it's so in this internal complexity of the CME is while in the case of SECI combining coronograph and heliospheric images, 
we don't we are unable to see this this structure one of the things also very interesting in terms of the seki c3 is that we are really having the 3d observation of the structures which give us this is a big discussion here give us a more realistic idea of the third dimension of the cines and hopefully with a solar orbiter going to the poles, we are going to be able to see more in 3D uh, these large scale structures. And this is another, another movie, just for joy, <laughs> uh, uh, of one of the observations of the South Pole of the Sun, as uh, it happened in, in, the, in March also last year. And we, we were able to observe, pues, all these uh, features that previously, I don't know if, if you have experience, but I, we never had these kind of scales uh, in the observations. And it's, it's, it's beautiful. And finally, uh, now I'm wrapping up. Um, there are two things that I wanted to say. One is the meeting next year in 2024 in April. Um, Obviously, when we talk about solar orbiter, we talk about collaboration. We collaborate a lot with Parker, and we are starting to collaborate with Dickist. And then uh, next year in October, in April, with the solar eclipse, we are going to have um, um, a meeting there. So you are all invited to come. And, uh, and we are also doing a lot of effort to combine this, this effort with the solar eclipse in 2026 here in Spain. I don't know if is there any activity. If you are thinking about something, let me know because I'm eager to, to learn and to look for how to combine efforts uh, into these two eclipses. And what's next? A part of this uh, workshop, uh, just as a summary, this, we are heading to the nominal mission. We are in the nominal mission. Next perihelion is going to be in October, 10 of October, more or less. It will be around 30 days, 35 days of observations with telescopes around the perihelion. If you go to the Confluence page, which is in the slide before, you can see all the activities. There are uh, active regions, uh, tracking, and also <coughs> the MOISAIC for the polarimeter. And there are uh, spectroscopy uh, activities. Go there and see if there is something that is interesting for you. Uh, in terms of, uh, this is something that I, we have also remote sensing synoptic observations like low latency observations daily. So and the, you can find all the data is public, publicly available in the ESA website and also in the NASA website. Usually it takes three months. There are instruments that are still um, struggling with the calibration and the validation, but most of them are you know, now smoothly um, bringing the data to the, to the community. And also, um, one more thing is, uh, well, now in October, I have, we are going to have at Godard another meeting. It is a very informal meeting, but if you go to the US and you want to stop by, let me know, because we are going to have like two days, two days and a half, and doing activities for new orbiters, for the whole teams, the US teams in general, but everybody is, is open to everybody. And then one dedicated uh, day for the, for the new, young generation, the early career, uh, postdocs or students working with solar orbiter or wishing to work with solar orbiter. And then also there is a, now an investigation, uh, guest investigation program. Uh, uh, funding is uh, you can submit proposal. You can't because you are if you if you don't have a U.S. affiliation. But it's very interesting uh, that if you collaborate with a U.S. team, you can be uh, involved in this investigation as collaborator, and eventually maybe to have a travel or to you know, to do this collaboration with the team in the U.S. And then this is it. And this is Solar Orbiter. This is uh, uh, the spacecraft. 
Um, and thank you very much. It was a pleasure uh, to be here and to present Solar Orbiter. We are all Solar Orbiters. I forgot to say something. I had the, the NASA in Espanol is led by one Spanish uh, journalist. Or, and she always, she, all, she learned that I was going to come here and she sent me this and say, hey, present NASA in Espanol. This is the website. You can receive also newsletters in Espanol uh, about what is going on in, in at NASA in general. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Teresa. Mm -hmm. You see, I was in line when I, when I said that we were lucky to have her here. <laughs> so, uh, any questions from here, from Zoom? Thank you very much, Teresa. It was really, really interesting and really amazing. I have uh, two questions. One is very short, and uh, all this material you presented is very interesting for outreach purposes. So. Is there a place where you... I mean, I can send you all. Everything is available in the NASA website and ESA website. My presentations are always available for you all. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Thank you so much. Very good material. And the second thing I wanted to comment is uh, when I talk to students about uh, spacecraft mission projects, I always like to stress the time, time scale, decades mm -hmm. of this project. So, oops. Yeah, I don't know what is going on. <laughs> well, it's at the end. So, yeah, uh, I was wondering if you have, you said that you were not on the boat since the beginning, but maybe you have some extra information about the initial sensor. So, when Solar Orbiter started to be created or devised or discussed or, or if you have some information to give to yourself? So, I know that even in the 80s, there were some kind of discussion about going to the sun. So that's why Parker Solar Pro. So in the 80s, there was, and I, I know because a lot of people, old guys told me, yeah, this is something that we have to discuss in, I don't know what meeting in the 80s. I know the, the, there was some discussion in the 90s also, <clears throat> and I think it was in 2000 something when they finally, the engineers, but I, they know probably better than me, but uh, no. Yo, yo. You are older than me, pero es más viejo que yo. Es solo para enfatizar y aclarar que son más viejos que yo. <laughs> but they, they probably know, but in the 2000s is when uh, the technology for the shields uh, in Parker, in Solar Orbiter, was developed. And then, you know, from there, it, it was, the planet was, was easier. No. Okay, thank you. I think these facts are very uh, enlightening for young generations. Think about this. Right, so there is uh, ongoing discussion always in the community because now that we have a small sats, these kind of missions are lifetime missions. You can spend your life, your research, your professional career <laughs> in these missions. And some, some young generations think that they don't want to spend, you know, all the time in, you know, the planning. Um, so with these small stats, there is a change in the trend or a parallel. Yeah. So I think that the idea of the Parker Solar Probe or going to the sun actually precedes NASA. Even mm -hmm. before NASA, they yeah. were already talking about sending something to the sun. Oh. That was one of the first ideas they had. Uh, doing the Van Allen probe and all of this. Mm -hmm. um, so, but my question is different. At the beginning of your talk, you were talking about Artemis and going back to the moon. Uh, well, it's also about history. Uh, during the Apollo era, uh, we were sending <coughs> astronauts to the moon without caring at all how the space were. And we know that it would be, I think it was Apollo 16 and Apollo 17. There was a major space weather event that would have been lethal to the astronauts. Mm -hmm. They would have been on, on the surface of the moon. So for Artemis, I know space weather is being taken care of and you know it's part of the program. But uh, I so can you explain what, what is NASA doing for taking care of the space weather sending astronauts in a safer manner? So there is a, now and we work together with them. We do research with Amanda. Amanda is in the group and, uh, and many other collaborators in the group, and we do in Glasgow, we do research. But we work very close with Moon to Mars. 
and there is multi-marsh obvious, a space weather obvious, and they are doing 24-7 uh, prediction activities, operations, and they are doing um, prediction in general, sending alerts to the spacecraft and getting ready. <coughs> So this is in terms of the prediction of this, the, the solar oh, activity. Uh, there is an, an fourth also in terms of to prepare the humans to explore how they are going to be dressed, what kind of sensors they are going to have, how it's going to be this, the way to alert, how it's going to be the shelter to protect them if they are in the space. So there is ongoing, not just the prediction itself, but also the protection. Uh, yeah, but so my question was more in trying to connect solar orbiter. Uh, the first way to make a prediction of the space weather is by getting a solar magnetograph uh -huh. and, you know, once you are the solar wind solution and all of that. You can use and we use HMI data, mm -hmm. but is there a plan for whenever David Orozco releases the data <laughs> to, uh, to use solar orbiter magnetograph data for producing a space weather? Yeah. Uh, WASA, the model, uh, there are many models using this data to feed the, the models to make the prediction. And if the model is, uh, the data is available, it will be used for the prediction, for sure. And they love the data. They are, they are just like this, waiting for that, this data. Good. <clears throat> no more questions? Maybe I can add on top of that uh, that there is uh, uh, there are predictions of CVEs uh, actually it's incorporated uh, was using the MAC data, the low latency MAC data in order to predict uh, the, the effects of the CV propagating uh, from lower radio distances to, to the Earth. So it's not only uh, SOFIC, which is um, a really good predictor or, or the best predictor uh, that we can have because we cannot predict the flares or, or anything, but uh, we can also predict how the CMEs are going to affect uh, oh, oh, oh. the Earth. Yeah, I remember now it was uh, the landing of the helicopter. I don't remember the name of the helicopter. But... Mars. It was like two, one year and a half or two years. Solar orbiter play as a, a critical role. It was happening in the landing, and it was a sudden event on the sun, and it was toward Mars. And for it was it was a very scary moment. The the team, as they were landing with the spacecraft, the the, the helicopter, they, they were asking us, can can we know what is going on? And we were able to, with the low latency data, we were able to make the prediction of the the heat of the the, the energetic particles that finally didn't go toward that direction. So solar orbiter play a very important role in that landing also. Mm -hmm. Very important, yeah. Any more comments or something from, from the people at Zoom? If not, yeah. thank you again, Teresa. It was, it was a pleasure. Thank, thank you very much for having me.